Hey everyone, I want to give you um, some updates uh, regarding the class. One important thing just to keep in mind is that you're actually over the hump <laughs> now that you've gotten through Marx and Weber. I think things are going to get a little more concrete um, and less theoretical. So we're going to look at the rise of the Soviet Union and its collapse, and we're going to look at uh, the rise and collapse of Nazism, and then we'll turn our attention to the developing world. Um, so we've got still a lot to cover, um, but in terms of, of, I think, the degree of abstraction and kind of the difficulty and density of the reading, it gets a lot easier. Um, so hopefully you've uh, got a, a pretty solid sense for things at this point in terms of the development of liberal capitalism and different explanations for it. Um, certainly one of the learning outcomes of this class was to have you interact with and, and think about uh, various explanations for the rise of the modern world and things like time discipline. Um, so I'll be looking forward to your papers. Make sure you get those in by 5 p.m. today. Um, what I wanted to do in this video lecture is to give you an example of the theory I've given you about political change. So I've suggested that political change happens in a very predictable way um, and it it follows essentially four stages. The first is a period of revolutionary ideology that drives um, institutional change. Uh, then a period of political organization and political consolidation that stakes out a bounded territory. And then a creation of, of a set of institutions to meet material needs. And then finally, uh, a culture begins to develop. I do want you to recognize that this is a Weberian theory, right? Because what does it start with? Ideology. Uh, if it were a Marxist theory, it would be closer to starting with that third stage. Notice that these things all do interact, though. I don't want to suggest that material changes in the end don't lead to a situation that becomes ripe for revolutionary ideologies. So in my mind, anyway, these uh, factors and these institutions do uh, run together and they uh, they interact with one another. And I'll try and explain that a little bit more. Um, all right. Well, let me jump into the to the explanation here or to the example. Let's suppose that I'm going to create what I will call a regime of truth. That is a new way of organizing society. Remember what institutions are: authoritative, standardized patterns of behavior. So any new way of life has to have a set of behaviors. If I believe that one of the best ways in which to organize people so that they really truly get to recognize and realize their true essence, well, I might suggest that people who really study their political science um, really have a higher understanding and a higher level of happiness and self-realization, self-actualization because of the intellectual work involved. Um, so I'm going to call this a regime of truth. And if we create our regime of truth, um, and I know it's far-fetched, by the way, so just please run with this for a second. Um, if we create this regime of truth, uh, we'll see that it actually goes through these four various stages. And in fact, I've in some ways already staked out the very first one, which is a revolutionary ideology, right? I'm suggesting to you that there's a particular way of life um, that helps to uh, elevate people's experience in life and makes a more meaningful life, and that is this idea of of studying political science all the time. So that would be the revolutionary period. Of course, it's pretty easy to sit around and think about ideas about how life could be better, but really that's not going to create institutional change where people actually in throughout society begin to organize their lives differently. Uh, in order to do that, you really do need that political change. So um, I might, for example, in this class, get a few of you to believe that studying political science is a calling and that we should be doing it and everybody should be doing it. That in and of itself isn't going to change the whole society's behavior. So I need to try and convince at least a few of you to go along with me to help enforce a certain pattern of life. Um, so let's suppose I've convinced a few of you to help create a political organization that would actually discipline other people's behavior. Um, now, in order to really make this uh, regime of truth uh, realistic, we need some bounded space because we live in a world that's populated by states that claim sovereignty over territories. And so if I all of a sudden say, I'm going to create this regime of truth, 
I'm essentially challenging the existing authority of the state that claims to make rules over an entire territory. So if I were to, um, if we were in a face-to-face -face class and I seized the classroom and said, this is the classroom that, or this is the, the place, the bounded territory for which we're going to create this new way of life, I will immediately, of course, have enemies from the outside. The college would, of course, be concerned, <laughs> likely call the police. Um, actually, people from the inside of the classroom might also do so. Luckily, though, if I've convinced a few of my followers, we can maybe bring in some guns or create an, a situation of enough force that we can compel the rest of you. Notice I do need to, to um, convince at least a few followers to go along with me. I can't do it all on my own. Um, but if I can convince just a few of you to help enforce the rules, we might get others to comply, even though they don't they they aren't true believers in the ideology. Um, so this bounded this creating this bounded space is probably the most difficult aspect of creating a new institu a new set of institutions in the modern world. Again, because you have to fight the existing authorities. Um, so oftentimes, when you see this sort of wide scale political change it often comes in a, at a moment in which the existing institutions are pretty weak. We'll see that that happens in Soviet Russia where the existing institutions were so weak anyway that it wasn't so hard to have a new revolutionary ideology that was very disciplined in its political organization take over um, the territory. So let's pretend then that we've now taken over the territory. And by the way, this is the most, as I've said, the most difficult part of um, the creation of institutions. Give that some thought. I address a little bit of it, uh, a little bit about why it's difficult, um, but I want you to just give that some thought and maybe we'll, all, we'll raise it later on. Maybe we'll see it in some discussions. Um, but once we've created bounded territory, if, if for some miraculous reason I'm able uh, with my uh, converts to create this bounded space in which we fend off all the outside enemies, um, then maybe people begin, right, to, in fact, live this new way of life. But what will we automatically face right near the beginning of, of the creation of this new set of institutions? What we'll face is the need to meet our material needs. During the revolutionary period and during, during a period of political consolidation, often regimes will just rely on their ability to um, commandeer and take uh, material um, goods and meet material needs through essential, essentially piracy. Um, so you can think about that again using this example, right? If, if we were able to take over a particular classroom building, we would still need to go out either to the school cafeteria or local restaurants and, and just bring in food. Uh, we wouldn't have the, cap, the capacity to create um, production and, and produce food on, on, on our own. Um, so the next stage, as you can gather, uh, in terms of institutional development is to, is to create a set of ins uh, socioeconomic institutions. So now we really hit to that economic stage. Um, and usually when those uh, institutions are created, they would more or less fit the ideology or be derived from the ideology. So my socioeconomic institutions are going to be informed by the, the initial revolutionary ideology. Um, remember, after all, the revolutionary ideology really is about a statement of identity, who I am as a person and who we want everybody else to be as people and what kind of society we want to create. Um, you'll notice, though, in the abstract sense, uh, revolutionary ideologies, they don't really have to perform. <laughs> but once you get to a political system, it, you really do need to create social discipline. And once you get to an economic system, you really do have to create economic and material growth or at least um, meet material needs. Otherwise, those institutions are going to be incredibly weak and, and unstable. Um, once you've got the economic conditions, however, then you can move on to the creation of a culture. So again, if we had taken over a classroom and we're able to create political discipline, we're able to create a set of socioeconomic institutions that reward and punish certain kinds of economic behavior, um, then it, eventually a culture develops. And by a culture, I just mean that people essentially accept the particular way of living as natural and you don't really think about it. You're socialized into that system. So certainly in a classroom setting, if that were the case, um, we'd, it'd be a pretty small group of people. Um, and uh, 
forgive the, the example here, but people would have to begin to procreate, right, and have children and so on. Those children would simply be socialized into the system and, and it would be a pretty stable uh, system at that point. But the children wouldn't necessarily believe in the original revolutionary ideology in the same way that the people that lived through the revolution might. Right? They don't have that sort of that uh, remembrance uh, of that initial time of sacrifice that created the new institutions. Um, one of the reasons, in fact, that we have so many holidays that celebrate the origins of any particular regime is that it's meant to, I think, reconnect the existing um, generation to those original revolutionary principles. Uh, we'll want to talk about corruption later on. We will talk about corruption later on in this class, but uh, what I would suggest to you is that corruption, in fact, is when uh, society and its institutions move too far away from those original revolutionary, uh, revolutionary ideas, we'll say it that way. Um, so the culture is just that informal acceptance of, uh, uh, in this case, this regime of truth where everybody studies political science. Um, naturally, um, as time goes on, people are going to kind of relax and not necessarily want to always read their Weber or their Marx. Um, and in that sense, too, you can already see corruption starting to um, emerge. There's more uh, formal definition of what corruption is in your lecture notes. Um, so please uh, read those carefully. Uh, there's not a whole lot of reading assigned for this week, but the, the lecture material is pretty extensive. And be sure to read, or I'm sorry, watch uh, Animal Farm and think about this model of political um, institution building. Uh, you'll see these four stages pretty clearly in, in that particular narrative as well. All right, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Take care.